Hello. The voice of design has been on a little bit of a hiatus because of, well, the state of the world, which is obvious to all of us. Our guest in today's episode, Max Beverton Palmer, wanted you all to know that while the world has clearly changed a lot since we recorded this podcast way back in February, which is sometime in the Cretaceous period, but the political and technological principles of his work haven't. The institute that he works for has pivoted to tackling the coronavirus crisis, and you can find out more at institute.global, and there are some reports there about how to use technology to get through the current crisis and adapt to our radically altered world. So we hope you enjoy today's conversation, and welcome back to The Voice of Design. Max? Can you hear me? Yep. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Voice of Design. I'm Erica Hall. I'm Mike Montero. Have we decided that you're the voice of design? Uh, obviously. Okay, good. Obviously. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. So I'm, you're, I'm you're the, it. I'm it. I'm I'm the talker. So the voice of design sounds like you. It shouldn't sound like me because I sound yeah. terrible. Did the voice of America have a particular sound? Uh, it sounds like two eagles screeching in like a sexual embrace uh, while going wow. down in flames. Way to, way to make us uh, classy hmm. here. Stay classy. Here, because today... <laughs> Take it sleazy. That made me sad. That uh, that finale made me sad. Okay, anyway, we have a anyway, guest yeah, we, we should have, introduce. Yeah, we have a nice guest. This is the banter portion. Yep. You uh, can banter with the guest as well. Now that, that we went on that tangent. With us today, we have Max <laughs> Beverton Palmer, who is the head of technology and something else. Head of tech and society. Head of tech uh, and society at the... Tony Blair Institute. Tony Blair yeah. Institute. Wait, that sounds, that sounds British. It is, yeah. Ah. Uh, it's in London, based in London, but uh, because it's technology, we have a global focus because technology isn't just limited to one country. Turns out. Mm. So what does the Tony Blair Institute do and how did you become the head of technology and society? Uh, so the Tony Blair Institute is a not-for-profit um, based in London, which focuses on two things. One, um, advising governments uh, around the world uh, in Africa, but not exclusively in Africa, on governance and good government, how you put in good institutions of society to make sure that governments deliver for citizens. And then we have a policy role as well, which I'm part of. So the policy team consists of two areas. One, which is about renewing the centre ground of politics. So providing centre ground politicians with radical policies that will make a difference to people's lives and make people want to vote for those policies and vote for those politicians. And part of that is technology. So we see there is a technological revolution which hasn't been properly harnessed by politicians, so they're not properly looking at how to mitigate the... I think it's been harnessed by some politicians. Yeah, harnessed, but maybe not in the, maybe in the, not in the right not way. Not in the way we intended it to be harnessed. No, I guess not. But all politicians need to understand technology and the technological revolution. Um, not to just focus specifically on technology policy, because you shouldn't have like healthcare... And social policy, technology is a part of all of those areas of um, of government and uh, people's lives. So why should you kind of limit it to one particular area? Right. Yeah. So I'm interested. And I, I think throughout this conversation, we'll probably have moments uh, where we say, so what does that mean in the UK? Because yeah. even though we ostensibly all speak English, Americans are, uh, you know, we, we use some words uh, differently. And so talk about the center ground. Like fanny pack. Wow. Could you? Yeah, I was just giving an example. Back. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds weird in both in English, American, British, yeah. American. It's not a good word. It, 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 it's really not a good really word. Is bum bag better? Bum bag <laughs> is absolutely not better. Waste pack. Waste pack. Waste okay. pack is because uh, here's here's a slight, here's another slight tangent. 
in my book, so I can also use this to to totally promote the second edition of my book. I was trying to to figure out a way to make statistics fun for people because I mm. talk about having to understand what statistical confidence means when you're creating surveys, which a lot of people don't understand. And so I came up with an anecdote of surveying a forest full of centaurs uh, in order to sell them waste packs. So there, I brought it all around. And I did determine that waste pack was the least problematic way to describe that particular... An anatomically correct... Satchel, yes. For wait, centaurs. It's not a shit bag? What? No, oh my God, they'd wear it around their waist, around the human waist. human. Which is where waste comes from. So anyway, could we go okay. back to anyway. talking about the center mm. ground? Yeah. And we'll talk a bit about what that means. So um, first off, uh, I don't really like the, the center ground as a, as a phrase. I prefer kind of progressive politics, which means different things around the world. But essentially, it means politics that works for everybody and can bring everybody along with them and provide kind of policy solutions mm -hmm. that work for them. So traditionally, you'd think about left wing and, and right wing and the center ground is somewhere in the middle. Interesting. But the, but the middle, as you're describing it, is progressive. The middle is progressive, yeah. And here we have found the the first important <laughs> that's a, that's That is a very big difference yeah. because in the U.S., when you say progressive, people immediately think, you know... Of, far left. The far left. Yes, because uh, as I'm sure you've heard, doing things like providing health care mm. to our people is is considered caring for everyone caring for caring everyone, for everyone. Is, uh, which seems like a, an of course common sense thing to do is somehow radical yeah radical here i guess a way of better better putting it then would be that the center ground is about finding a particular kind of politics which people will vote for and can provide consensus mm -hmm. because like it's it's really good to have like great ideas that make a difference for everybody, but we live in democratic societies, so therefore you have to get people to vote for them as well. Yeah, and that is uh, that can be very tricky because, uh, as we've seen a lot, getting people to vote for what is in their best interest is something that, on the face, sounds very simple, but uh, in reality, I think can be kind of difficult. And so talk a bit about the what what is the actual work like? What is the work that we do? Yeah. Yes. So I'm part of a technology team. So I'm head of tech and society. So we look at, uh, in particular, social issues around technology. Mm -hmm. So uh, future of news in the public sphere, how you might regulate social media, um, and also how you might improve systems of representation to get people's views about what they want out of politics and society. We also have teams working on things like startups and software as infrastructure and future of healthcare, future of food, mm -hmm. trying to essentially, what we do is we structure problems. So mm -hmm. we try and take all of those policy recommendations that you have at the back of academic reports mm -hmm. and turn them into something politically workable. Yeah, that's very interesting and important work because I, I, what I've seen is there's just, there seems to be a, just a huge schism and clearly this is what you're working on between what's going on in academia and i think it's it's particularly bad here in america and what could possibly be feasible or workable because a lot of times uh, the academics are the opposite of interested in practical application of the thinking mm. how do you bridge that gap what sort of strategies are, are you using like once you sort of frame out the problem and and decide that this is an area to to work on so you, first off, you need to upskill politicians in how to master the technological revolution. So kind of brief them, talk to them about exactly kind of the problems they need to address and the solutions that might be out there. We think about what we'd call retail politics. That, mm -hmm. So the idea that you need something that's sellable to people in order to get them to vote for it, but also that has the like intellectual thud factor. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. So essentially, you come along with like a policy briefing and it's full of lots of pages and it kind of thuds down on the table because it, it, there's a lot of work in there and there's mm -hmm. a lot of detail. But then not everybody's going to read that thousand pages, but they need to then know exactly what the kind of key mm -hmm. salient points are. Um, and that's what we try and do. We kind of take those key salient points and put them into something that's politically workable. Finding the problem and then finding the solutions, trying to actually find the answer rather than just kind of worry around a problem. Wow, that is, I think that that's, that's important and, 
and huge, hugely ambitious. And it's so it's so funny that you you talk about the thunk factor. Thud factor. The, yeah. Oh, thud. Oh, it's thud. thud See, yeah. we found it. It's thud. Uh, yeah. There, we talk about the thunk factor. Oh, right. Okay. So our onomatopoeia of the large research report is also. Wow. Okay. <laughs> it lands differently it lands, in the American yeah. table. Okay. Yeah, yeah. it does. <laughs> to the resonance, it's more of a thunk. Uh, like our design work has always been research based, and it really is the the challenge that to have something that you can back up with data, but but translating that into something that's intelligible and work, workable and that you can take action on is is really huge. And a lot of times the people doing the research do really focus on well, we have to be very thorough, but the capacity of uh, of the human mind and especially somebody working in politics or or in business who's dealing with a lot of and I think they're kind of similar in terms of the figuring out what to optimize for and having many opinions coming at them. Well well I mean one of the things that we've always been big proponents of is you do the work, you do the research, you get the data and then you craft a story around it. Yeah. Because people are persuaded by stories, not by data. Yeah. Cuz I mean we have so much data right now. And yet we're, you know, not doing well. So we're not here because of a lack of data. Yeah. Well, I, I, the way I think of it as well, which is quite similar, is about a chain of expertise. So you have the the data scientist or, or the person collecting data at one side, which understands the problem intricately, understands literally how something is built and something is made, how something is designed. And then you have on all the other side, there's somebody who communicates it or somebody who communicates it politically mm -hmm. or there's the politician who communicates it to the electorate um and in between that there's a load of different people who have a various different like knowledge and skill at, at understanding the actual problem but they're all important as a chain and you can't and sometimes we kind of miss out and we think that just because you can't explain it to somebody in layman's terms mm -hmm. that you've failed but actually what you need to find is somebody who understands it a bit and then also has that storytelling skill mm -hmm. as well to build that chain. And so we're all different parts of that chain and we're part of the political chain in the oh. organization. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense because just uh, between the two of us, I have historically been an abysmal storyteller. And I think that's really where <laughs> when we've been working with clients. Well, I mean, to tell the story, to, to, to teach people about class struggle, you need to write Animal Farm. To teach people about regulation, you need to write the jungle. Yeah, you need to figure out what the st what's the story that'll resonate with people mm -hmm. to get them to understand the these these not abstract concepts but complex mm -hmm. subjects in yeah. a way that resonates with yeah. them. And I think the trouble is, and I don't know if if you've found this in your work that um, that the people who are very evidence minded might resent the fact that it has to be, I won't say coded with a story, but presented in the context of a story because shouldn't the truth be enough to convince people? Yeah, I completely, I completely agree. And you often find that you get these, yeah, hundred page research documents where it seems to them like the answer is clear and that it's a compromise actually having to explain it. But then mm -hmm. I think this is some of the problem we have with um, politics as well is that there's a kind of failure to convince as well and that part of the job is convincing and convincing isn't just you going out there and telling somebody what's best for them mm -hmm. it's you going out there and having a conversation and finding out what their what their interests are and that this idea that um the people are stupid uh, because they vote for one thing or something else is is really dangerous to get yeah. into mm -hmm because then you completely ignore their perspectives and they're a citizen and as well, and they have a vote, so they mm -hmm. have a right to have a, a view on something and you may fundamentally disagree with it. Um, you want to try and convince them some otherwise, but their, their opinion is still an opinion that has weight in our democratic society. Mm -hmm. Also, saying that politicians don't understand to, how to do this is ignoring the 50% of politicians who do understand to mm -hmm. do this. Both our countries have people in power right now who are very good storytellers. Mm. They're also psychopaths, but they're very good storytellers. And what they managed to do is figure out how to tell a story that resonated with people. And it's, a, it's full of lies, but it is a story that resonated with people. 
and it resonated with the worst parts of people. But they know how to do this. Why aren't we studying that? Or are we? Yeah, I think we are. And it's a it's a challenge for politicians on all sides to find out how to get how to tell stories that resonate with people, but also that ultimately come up with policy and thinking that makes mm -hmm. a difference to people's lives in a in a positive way. Yeah. And I think and this is this is something I find if there is one case I find myself making over and over again, it's that if you want to convince someone of something, you have to start not by making an argument, but by asking questions. And this can feel very uncomfortable for for people who have a very strong sense of I know what's right. You have a different belief. I'm going to come to you with facts and convince you as opposed to just starting to ask questions and not even direct questions, but questions about their lives to understand them, to actually empathize with them. And sometimes people feel that if someone's in the wrong, empathizing with them is validating their wrong opinion, right? If somebody is, for example, Say in America, say, say your your racist uncle in America, which is the uh, the classic like which oh, I'm one? going I'm which going one? home for a holiday, and I'm going to I'm going to talk to my racist uncle, and the and the impulse is to argue with that person and say this is why you're wrong, and it's actually more effective to convince them to just sit and listen to them, yeah. and and have that relationship and create that foundation. But there's a sense that. Uh, you're validating and supporting that person's perspective if you aren't just immediately coming in and shutting it down. Yeah, I completely agree. And so the Institute does a lot of work around counter extremism as well. Mm -hmm. So we've got so had some really interesting projects in the UK, which I'm not a part of, but mm -hmm. um, called uh, Narratives of Hate, looking at um, narratives of hate, both on the far right and um, Islamist extremism as mm -hmm. well. And we had a fascinating session before Christmas, where actually some ex-extremists came in from the far right. Um, one guy who, who was a, um, I think he was part of the English Defence League, which from the title you can judge what position they were taking on various mm. things like immigration. Mm. And then an ex-Islamist um, preacher who are now friends. And the interesting thing about what they were saying is doubt, the concept of doubt, that it wasn't that somebody came and told them you were wrong and this is the facts and this is why you're wrong. It was they had conversations with one another that caused them to doubt their own mm -hmm. beliefs. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think this is the it comes into the debate about social media as well. So social media and arguments we all know about how you get into Twitter spats or kind of battle with Facebook or you might see your racist uncle on Facebook and try to argue with him on particular positions. Um, but the other side of social media is actually it opens up a whole world of different opinions that, um, that you might have never known and that I'm learning about different mm -hmm. cultures and different people and different lived experiences around mm -hmm. the world from social media that I would have never known about. And that's an incredibly powerful tool in changing opinion and mm -hmm. educating us all. Yeah. But you can't you just can't come at it head on because what you're doing is you're you're undermining that person's worth. Yeah. And that is no way to make friends, like coming to somebody and saying you're wrong and you're a terrible person and none of your lived experience has value, which is how they hear any of those attacks. They're immediately mm. going to shut down. And that's, I think, just how humans work. Yeah. And that's what happened with um, Brexit in the in the UK as well. Um, so people one diagnosis is that people voted for Brexit because they felt that they weren't being listened to mm -hmm. about their concerns and, and whether the solution fit the problem um, is, a, is a big question. Mm -hmm. But actually, at its heart, it was people felt they weren't being listened to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like the key insight about humans <laughs> is that that's what everybody really like kind of, I think, wants at the, at the basis is, is to be listened to, which is why I'm so glad that I am the voice of design. Mm -hmm. So and I'm I, just sitting here listening. Yeah. yeah, you're just sitting here listening. Yeah. And so so now I'm interested about the the helping politicians understand technology piece of it because yeah, we really see that here like we we have continuous, you know, our federal legislatures give us material for jokes in terms of talking about oh the internet is made of tubes or completely misconstruing what is possible. So how do you how do you approach that? How do you approach bringing somebody along? Let, let, me, let me ask a, a precursor to that question. Yeah. Do they want 
<laughs> to learn <laughs> yeah. this stuff. Oh, that's a good point. So I can only speak um, at the moment from the from the UK British perspective. Um, but yes, people do. And there's lots of politicians who are incredibly skilled at, at understanding these things who've worked in technology mm-hmm. industries themselves now. It's like back in the 90s, like people were scared of setting VCR, but they still wanted to like record what they watched on, te- on mm-hmm. telly. Mm-hmm. So it's like poli- that's politicians now. They, they have an intrinsic understanding of their constituents and the people voting for them. And they understand that technology is changing things, but they just don't properly have an articulation of like how to deal with that and how to structure their thinking around it. And sometimes that results in solutions which are like block this, ban mm-hmm. that, turn it off, which often isn't the right answer. Or the other side is allow it all and just let, let the mm-hmm. kind of libertarian example, like let let the world free and, and uh, it will sort itself out. Mm-hmm. But there's a kind of, middle ground in all of that which is properly understanding and, and having a structure that you can deal with the problem and going back and not, and not and saying that technology hasn't reinvented everything like it's changed mm-hmm. a lot of things but actually we we can't just say that when google came into being when facebook came into being it, it reset mm-hmm. society it didn't uh, and society is kind of adapting to these technologies but the core principles of community and culture still apply. Yeah. And so when you, and technology can mean many things. So what would you say are the key aspects of technology that you think it's important for um, policymakers, politicians, legislatures to understand that maybe they don't get already? Uh, I I think the key point is that uh, technology has has an impact on society and you need to get... um, consent from populations in order to do great things with it. So a good example would be law enforcement. Facial recognition is a new technology that police forces are deploying around the world. The Met Police in London has just um, announced it will will start using it as a technology. Mm -hmm. But what they need to understand is that uh, government and society is an important part of that technology and that you need to build policies and regulation that reassure people and achieve consent from people and protect people against some of the harms mm-hmm. while making use of the benefits mm-hmm. of them. It's been banned here, right? Banned? In San Francisco. Oh, in San Francisco. Oh, here in, San- in the San city Francisco. of San Francisco. Yeah. The city of San Francisco has banned facial recognition technology. In- interesting. Yeah. yeah, I think I, I heard something about that. Yeah the, the, yeah, the strange thing here is that there's so many levels of jurisdiction and the United States is so large that it really is like from one state to another, it's another country. Well, California is another country. Yeah. California is really another yeah. country. But I mean, I think the reasoning, the city's reasoning is that, I mean, you idiots have screwed this up so much that we can't trust any of you. So it's a failure. It's a policy failure mm. and an ethical failure. We can't trust you with this data. So we're going to outlaw it completely. Yeah. Which I totally understand in the context of, you know, what, what, you know, what's been happening with that data. Exactly. But that's only ever going to be a temporary solution Mm -hmm. as well. It's like the technology exists, it's there, it has benefits as well as risks. So banning it might be, might be, I don't know the specific situation, but it might be the right example in, in, where we are at the moment. But in order to move things on and to realize those benefits, you need the right policies in place and the right ethical codes and proper data Mm -hmm. uh, and and properly kind of good data sets, which Mm -hmm. are diverse and uh, reflect society in order to make the right decisions. What about people? And the right people as well. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I guess that is the most important thing in it is a kind of diversity of people working on these things and diversity of ideas and an inclusive environment in which their views can be represented as well. Yeah, because what what we've really witnessed, observed, because we've been here living and working in San Francisco for quite some time and watched these companies grow right right in front of us. You know, Twitter started literally across the hall from us Mm. in a, a previous office building. And we could see how the the seeds were sown for things being terrible in the future just because the initial teams weren't sufficiently diverse Mm. to understand some of the risks, because I think that's where you get into what people's lived experiences are. And you might think that like just allowing complete freedom is great for everybody because what could the possible downside be 
because you're not a person who has experienced the downside of, say, someone knowing where you live or being followed home or being stalked or being harassed online. And just like having somebody with that experience as part of your initial team can help shape the direction technology goes. Absolutely. And I think as policymakers, people, you need to create the incentives for companies to build diverse teams and to get those things right as well, put the regulation in place. But at the heart, it, it comes, yeah, you want a, you want a team that works yeah. on the team that understands it because they have experience of it as well. But then I, I sometimes think that this the diversity debate absolves people with privilege from thinking about it, but it's, mm-hmm. it's really important that like yeah. me, like a, as a white man ha- with privilege, also has to think about other mm-hmm. people's lived experiences and is forced to do that. So before I worked at the Tony Bear Institute, I worked for Sky um, as head of digital policy there, which meant working with the government um, to get them to better understand um, Sky's business, but then also actually working with the Sky's business and technology design mm-hmm. to make sure it was designing responsible products. So I'm not a designer, but we built a, um, a parental controls app. So we went out um, to market research teams and asked uh, parents what they want from wanted to have to protect their children. They were like, give us all of it. Give us the control. Give us all the data about what our children are looking at all the time um, and all the location data, oh but which is what you'd expect mm-hmm. um, yeah. from, from parents who want to look out after yeah. their children. So we designed a better we work with the company to build a um, parental controls app. But the problem is when you design something which is essentially surveillance technology, mm-hmm. even for legitimate use, people can put it to bad use. And And I had a conversation with a domestic violence charity in the UK called Refuge. Mm-hmm. Um, and you talk to them and you just listen to the stories that they tell and just the simple data, like one mm-hmm. in four people, one in four women in the UK will experience domestic violence in their lifetime. And it's it's kind of staggeringly high and it's it's around that number in different mm-hmm. places in the rest of the world but it's yeah. and that's it's a ignored. self-reported number uh, i think it, it'll be survey data and self-reported yeah so i imagine the actual number is higher yeah exactly and it depends on your definition as well mm-hmm. whether yeah. you're admitting to yourself but therefore once you understand something like that when you understand the lived experiences of some people and sky was a mass market company so it was building products for millions of people. Mm-hmm. So unfortunately, there are people in Sky's customer bases who are both victims and perpetrators of domestic violence. And you can either kind of ignore that and say, oh, yeah, well, it's not our problem. That's the kind of their problem. Or say, mm-hmm. actually, what small difference can we make in our products to protect people? So one of the things we did was to build a what I call a never block, never track list of mm-hmm. websites, so mm-hmm. domestic violence helplines. Um, but then we threw in LGBT advice in there as well and child support services as mm-hmm. well. So sites that if you navigate to um, using your app, you will never, uh, they will never be blocked and they will never be tracked, never reported to the master app. So a kind of escape wow. route, like mm-hmm. a small, a small, it's a really small yeah. bit of technology design. But um, I think it, for me, it, it, it's a good example about how it's really important if you have a kind of have privilege to then seek out Mm -hmm. that data those perspectives to try and work out what are the best solutions as well yeah i think that's a that's a really good point i was having a discussion with some folks on twitter about this uh, about diversity and and privilege and things like that and yeah the the point is you need um you can't just talk about diversity because what happens and I've, i've seen this in some of our client organizations is that they say oh well the the people who represent those perspectives, we can put all the work on them. And um, and that's not good. It's like, oh, this is your problem to solve because you represent the uh, set of people who have this problem. As opposed to, you know, you need both. You need everybody with privilege to be interested in all sorts of people, people with problems not like their own. And you need more representative teams. And this seems to be a perspective that makes people's heads explode, that it's it's not enough to either just be a person with privilege doing research, and it's also just not enough to hire people and have a, a diverse team and then say, oh, this is not my problem. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and there's some really interesting work. So there's um, 
uh, one of the best people in the UK on this is um, a woman called June Sarpong, mm-hmm. who was previously a children's TV presenter or a kind of young adult TV presenter. But she's um, a kind of senior exec around diversity at the BBC mm-hmm. in London. And she's written a really great book called Diversify, mm-hmm. which is essentially, it's not really a technology book, but it's about how you can better understand other people and how you should check your own, what she calls isms. So Mm. like check Mm -hmm. your own, your biases, but also your particular perspectives as Mm -hmm. well, because bias is sometimes a bit too strong. Like where are you coming from? Where are other people Mm -hmm. coming from? And that was kind of really, I think the model that, I think sometimes we can get too preoccupied with ethics and have a lot of conversations about AI. um, And sometimes the solution is essentially write a kind of, 50 page AI code of ethics Mm -hmm. when actually if you think about what do people what do people on the ground need they need uh, a bit of a spark Mm -hmm. to think about somebody else's perspective and so you can do that with data you can do it get with getting people in you can do it with like diverse teams obviously Mm -hmm. but you're never going to get an exactly representative team right. because you're never going to have a team full of like 100 people who are demographically perfect but then i shouldn't absolve you as you as you were saying mm-hmm. from like actually thinking about it and doing both things yeah so that i think that brings up an interesting point about which actions fall under whose purview because especially like an organization and that that's so fantastic that sky did that and and created more safety for people because that's I've talked to some some people very recently who are creating tools for access control to make it easier for people to manage their own data their own access to systems and from the beginning you need to think about those bad actors and people don't want to think about that people want to think about what's the customer journey what's the happy path and it can be very difficult for you to as an organization creating these tools to think from the get go how can these be misused because we are asking people to not only like designers talk about empathy all the time and it's it's the case that you can not only need to empathize with the people who need your help or support or protection but you also need to empathize with the bad actors and i think that can be very upsetting for people who don't want to think about that yeah and i think that you're absolutely right and what people tend towards after going through that thought process is I'm just going to kind of ignore it and I won't think about it because that's easier. Um, And I worked around child abuse imagery for Sky. Uh, So we worked with a charity called the Internet Watch Foundation, which is supported by lots of technology companies that that essentially does an amazing job at taking down child sexual exploitation material from the internet um, and reporting it and finding it. And it's really uncomfortable to talk about. It's oh. really like deep and it's like, it's pretty horrible and not, uh, it's incredibly nasty stuff. But you need to kind of understand these things in order to take responsibility and find out your own path and what you can mm-hmm. do to make things better. And so kind of try and talk about it because you, you confront people with it and you're like, it exists, it's out there. So therefore we need to kind of work together to resolve it. And I think it's a good example of where like technology industry has got together and has done some great stuff mm-hmm. from like, Microsoft building its hash list of images and things like that to make a difference. Um, but that only happens if you confront other people with it and confront yourself with it as well yeah. as an issue. So, I mean, there are things that are just like universally like this is terrible. Mm. We can't have this. That's the easy stuff. Mm. And then there are people who are bad. <laughs> Like, I'm going to use technology to do bad things, evil laugh. Mm. But I think an even bigger problem is, I just want to take us back a little bit, people who are inadvertently doing terrible things because they're not thinking about what, uh, how these things might be used or that they're ignorant of how these things might be used. I want to get back to the diversity thing a little bit. Mm. Or they've never run across these things before. I mean, I've talked at length about Twitter and how Twitter and the founding of Twitter and, you know, a room full of white boys with good intentions, mm. most of them good people. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jack wasn't there yet. Uh, Jack's a prick. But most of them were good people trying to put something positive into the world. Mm. And they ended up building a thing that was built with good intentions by people who had a very, very limited 
view of what happens in the world. And that's the thing that I think that's where we can do the most fixing is by convincing uh, people like that, that even though they're good people with good intentions, you can still fuck up because your sliver of the world is very, very narrow. Just a couple of weeks ago, we saw, I mean, there was a, a, a new social network that was announced, and I won't mention it because one, I forget what it's called, and two, I don't want to, you know, purposely shame the people who built it. But it, and it, it was being sold at, or marketed as this is an alternative to all, you know, the bullshit that you find on Twitter. And and I looked at at the 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 photos of all the founders, and again, here's a team of white boys, and I I even know some of them. They're very smart, very well intentioned, very good people. Yeah, and I, I something tells me that in their mind they thought, well, you know, we're good people, so we, this won't be a problem. Yeah, and I think sometimes you just need to learn as as one of those people just to when to get out of the way and when to like both to draw other people in, but when also like you in, you can't. I'm very conscious of all of this that you can't speak for people you you don't represent or you don't have that lived experience of as well. And so, yeah, I guess in that situation, it's interesting why why you wouldn't in like twenty twenty try and seek out a bit more of a diverse perspective rather than thinking you can kind of fix it all by your yeah. own intellect. Well, and and I know that they did, uh, the, the people you're talking about did do some research, but I think the uh, the fundamental issue in uh, putting it all on the sort of designers or architects of these systems is you have to talk about the business model because with something like like going back to Twitter, why is Twitter like it is? It isn't just because there was a lack of diversity on the team or they didn't, you know, really fully understand how it could be misused. The fundamental problem is that the success of the business is tied to misuse because if there is like yeah. outrage and abuse and pylons and this sort of charismatic toxicity that happens there, that's actually good for Twitter. And we've seen the same right. thing in our news media in America because of the business model. Mm. They have an interest. Their business success is tied to creating, say, more of a sense of controversy or a horse race in an election. Let's let's use the um, uh, the model case of, say, there's an election between a very qualified candidate and a wildly unqualified candidate. There's no story there if the news just reports, wow, one of these candidates is wildly unqualified, boring story. Right. But creating a horse race between the two and elevating the one who's less qualified is in the interests of selling papers, even though it's not in the public interest. And that is baked into the business model and we have to fix some things there. Yes. Before we move into business models, there's 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 a thing that just popped into my head and then we can finish off the diversity conversation. Mm. And it's it, it's a quote from my friend Ross Float. Uh diversity is certainly not the solution to every problem, but it's never been the cause of one. Now, business models. Yeah, I was just going to say on that. I I I completely agree. Um but I think there is cause for some cautious hope in all of this and mm -hmm. that you're seeing oh, please. <laughs> companies respond to this and understand that like controversy and abuse and harassment and harm isn't the right way to do it. Um, I think what sometimes they're missing is that actually that governments and society are an important part of resolving that and they need to work with them on on regulation and, and to be regulated in order to improve the systems. It can't just be a, a, a like a technology design challenge that you mm -hmm. solve to make things better, like society and governments have a stake in, in social media and online platforms and need to be part of the solution and create the right regulatory incentives to make things better. But like specific examples, like Twitter's high, um, ability of people to hide replies, I mm -hmm. think is a, is a great in innovation. And so there's some little design things that they started mm -hmm. to do. I'm really interested in um, 
in what Instagram is doing with hiding likes mm -hmm. and hiding those engagement mechanisms. They're, they're realizing that actually, you know what, like getting people to want to post something that will get the most likes isn't necessarily the most healthy way of looking at mm -hmm. content or engaging or the most mentally uh, isn't, yeah, isn't the, the best way to measure your self-worth. So I think there are some positive aspects. And I would say that uh, it's really important that we, as a society, champion the connection between governments and society mm -hmm. uh, and social media platforms and don't put them out on one edge and say they're just doing bad things. And mm -hmm. you should reward the, reward the good things, but also have conversations with the people who are the public representatives of these companies. Yeah, and I, I could see how really... Um... Uh, your work could be could be important going back to to regulation because I think we're really at the point where we're talking like these um, these companies have gotten so large like Facebook has more users than the vast majority of countries mm. on earth they, have they, I, citizens. I believe they claim three billion at this point oh so would that make them the biggest country like more people are citizens of facebook than well they are i mean citizens and they want their own currency so yes yeah. i think that's where they're headed yeah uh and i believe they have they're meeting the standard of wow this this organization is so large uh and powerful that we need to to break them up and but they're we're, deciding elections yeah but we're we're up against the facts that you know capital both uh, capital goods and information are all moving across borders. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I think we're we're even at the point of what even is a nation state in, in world history. It's but an that's, antiquated concept. Yeah. So that's even sort of like. So how does one? How does the government of one state regulate an entity that completely crosses crosses borders and and has that sort of outside power? But in doing that, I could see how. Like we have a, a lot of issues with people not supporting regulation in America for a, a bunch of odd reasons, right? They don't support regulation in their own interest because of feelings about how the government shouldn't interfere with things. So I could I could see that a, an important part of the work of explaining technology is so that politicians could explain the ramifications of potential regulation back to the voters. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, and 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 all of this, and uh, politics always wins out in these situations. Mm -hmm. Politic politics always. Um, I'm trying to not use the word trumps. Um, right, but, there's a whole right. But, um, so politics always um, always wins out over um, economics in the end. Like it yeah. always and um, commercial mm -hmm. interests. Yeah, if we look at throughout history, it, politics always rules supreme um, because we live in in societies which are governed by people with mm -hmm. democracies or authoritarian regimes. Mm -hmm. So, and regulation is a really important part of that as well. And I guess, yeah, the, the job for politicians is to convince people that it, it is better to have regulation. But regulation is, is not just simply about cracking down or restricting. It's about creating the right incentives to mm -hmm. create the society you want to create. I think that's what sometimes we get a bit wrong with looking at how to regulate social media. So in the UK, there's a big debate about um, online harms and some legislation shortly to go through our parliament uh, to look at providing a regulatory model for social media and for online platforms like YouTube. Mm -hmm. but what, what, we need to, what we need to do is properly focus on what are the right outcomes and what incentives we, we, we want to create for these um, platforms in, in exactly the way you, you guys do around design, for example, mm -hmm. about what is responsible design and think about that more broadly about how you create regulation that incentivizes that. You know, people in tech tend to speak about regulation as if uh, as if we're going to vote on it. Regulation comes from government bodies, and it tends to happen when an industry starts killing people. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's. I, I I went to Facebook once, um, actually invited, didn't sneak in, and there was a poster hanging up in the hallway that said uh, Orville Wright didn't have a license. <laughs> Which was, <laughs> I know, right? But and well, he didn't have a license. Yeah, and and yet, uh, so I really doubt that there's a Facebook employee anywhere who would get on a plane with an unlicensed pilot. I mean, whoever invented the car did not have a driver's license. The person who invented social media did not have a social media license. Things 
get regulated once they start killing people. Once there's a certain number of planes in the sky, well, we need to figure out what's actually going on up there to make sure they're not hitting any hitting each other yeah. or falling on the people down below. Once there's enough uh, uh, cars on the road, uh, well, one, we need roads, uh, but once there's enough cars out there, they're going to start hitting each other if we don't put in some rules and regulations and shit. And we're still at the point with uh, with uh, technology or the internet or social media or whatever you want to call it, where, I mean, we've had like our Wild West moment of anything goes, and now we're killing people. We are actually killing people using social media. It's insane to think that regulation's not coming because it has come for every other industry when it reached this point. Yeah. So debating whether we're going to get regulated is the biggest waste of, of, of air that anybody can, can like, like it's, it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's coming throughout the world. And again, it's what I said earlier, it's politics. Uh, politics is winning out. And so there's different sources of power in society and the commercial power is being brought to bear by politics. And but at the end of that, you need to know what is good regulation, because mm-hmm. um, there's a reason why these platforms are so popular and, and so used. It's because they provide massive like societal benefit and mm-hmm. they make people's lives better in lots of ways. And and that's social media as well. And you, you can't kind of simply go out and say that social media is terrible because it provides amazing, amazing kind of educational opportunities for people. And, and just it's fun as yeah. well in lots of ways. Agreed. But then, therefore, what you, that means is you need good regulation that works on, on kind of good regulatory principles. And even more, as a, as a world, we need to think about what are those international agreements we need mm-hmm. in order to get the right values. What are the right values for our technology companies that we can agree internationally that will um, make them work better for people and to mm-hmm. stop them from... Yeah, kind of causing extreme harm to people as well. Yeah, so so that's so that brings up an, an interesting point. So what what sort of international cooperation are are you looking at as part of your work or or trying to facilitate? Like, on what level could governments or organizations, uh, like civil society organizations, work together to address some of these things across national borders? Mm. So uh, we wrote a report last year or some colleagues of mine wrote a report on how to regulate big tech Mm -hmm. Uh, and part of that is finding the right values and agreeing the right values internationally about how to regulate uh big tech so you need to think about like is there example of like the is there a modern Bretton woods that you Mm -hmm. can create like the right institutions globally that i'm sorry what so um the Bretton woods conference was uh, held in 1944, which is was was also known as the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference, and essentially, it, um, it the agreements created the uh, International Monetary Fund, uh, International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and other kind of global mm-hmm. financial yeah. institutions, and we're probably at the point where we need the equivalent for technology. Mm -hmm. And that can't just be a kind of internet governance model. It has to be a proper societal model, which involves like discussion about communications and information and what are the standards we want to hold countries to. That doesn't mean you shouldn't have like national rules as well, Mm -hmm. which kind of focus on nationally specific problems, but actually we need to, as, as a kind of global institutions decide how to govern technology companies. Yeah. That, it sounds like that's the right thing to do, but then I'm imagining like finding common cause <laughs> between like if you say like, OK, who like really needs to lead this? Like we would need the U.S. and China and Europe and India and the U.K. Mm. and uh, Korea. And yeah, and It's not this generation of people. I wonder. I wonder if we're not like we have to solve other problems things about the world because the thing that you you think about like well what happened right before that it was Mm. very like things got to let's call it a bad place in a sort of world historical sense and and i think what we're seeing now in politics is kind of the what feels like the recapitulation the recapitulation of some of the things that led up to world war 
to, which is sort of terrifying. And it's like, can we get to that place of agreement without having things go very, very bad first? Yeah. Although what you need to do is you need to create the foundations for these things. And it's not a problem you can solve within a generation, but somebody needs to start. And yeah. the person who starts it probably won't be the person who finds the solutions or get necessarily gets the credit for it. Mm -hmm. Or um, the person who is benefiting from the way it was broken. Exactly. Which is what makes me think this is not the generation who's going to fix this. Mark Zuckerberg, for example, to pick one example out of thin air, has benefited very, very well from the way things are broken. In fact, I mean, he's right now he's capitulating to to everything that, you know, mm -hmm. the 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 air quotes government of the United States wants Facebook to be doing to avoid being regulated. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I, I can say that. I can I can I can talk shit about the US government. <laughs> well well the other thing is like like George Soros, another person who talks shit about people, he just had a, an op ed in New York Times and said pretty much exactly like Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg can no longer run Facebook. Yeah, because I totally as agree. long as they run Facebook, Facebook will destroy democracy. This I'm so, it's a rough summary. Yeah, that's not an exaggeration. I yeah. don't think that's hyperbolic. Yeah. But uh, I'm not going to uh, defend all of their yeah. their decisions, mm -hmm. but actually, if you look at things like the Facebook Oversight Board, it's an attempt to try and come up with a solution to some of the harms on the platform and to trying to find an independent way to decide these things. Yeah. And I just kind of will disagree with the like the way the, the what they come up with and some of the policy decisions. But actually, they are trying to put in mechanisms to give civil sort of society a, a role in that. I, I'm a little bit more cynical than you. Mm. Uh, I think they do enough to make it look like they're doing something. I I don't trust them. I do not trust a single thing they're doing when they say they're trying to improve the platform. The only thing they're trying to improve is to make sure that they've got money flowing in their direction. Well, I think that um, I, and if you believe that, that's why you need you can't always do things in isolation. The, the governments and regulators and civil society need to work together to kind of find the compromise, find the right solution to impose controls on commercial entities, but also talk to them to kind of force them in the right direction as well. So the face the oversight board might not be the perfect solution that solves things, but it definitely takes you a step forward. And whether the motivation is kind of purely cynical or not, it probably makes the situation better and reduces harms mm -hmm. and make and enables them to make better decisions. So in terms of outcomes, you've, you've probably got to a better place. Yeah. And, and I think the maybe one of the lessons in this is just we cannot let up with the public pressure on mm. Facebook, because that's what has led to some of these changes. Like that's what's I think led to some of the design changes at Twitter is, is just hammering on the harms and creating a bad PR situation. Yeah. So, uh, and then if you, you take it back from the macro level, big global companies down to individual level as well. And you talk about what is, what are those actual people that are, that go and talk to governments and, and go and lobby governments. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they're an important part of the puzzle that's really missed from our debate about technology and design. So there are people who go out from companies and talk and go in DC and, and London and other and Brussels and other capitals around the world and argue for their companies, the lobbyists. I was one at Sky. And you could see it as just a kind of external outward facing role where you go and communicate something. But if you look at like, who are those people? They're often people who've actually probably worked in government in the past mm -hmm. who have some experience right. of it. They're really interesting, fascinating people because they obviously have a social conscience or, or want to change the world in some way because they chose to work in governments or they're interested in policy and, and politics. And whether you agree with the way they want to change the world or not, they actually kind of have a have a stake in it and interest in it. And so those are really important people to consider because they are also the people who reflect back civil society and governments into their companies and can make, can actually affect change. So I always think about how you need to empower those people, empower those lobbyists to go back and say, look guys, like actually we need to change this because I know you've got this commercial business model, but if you don't do this, then actually they're going to regulate us and make things even worse, or they'll break up the company, etc. And so they're the people who can affect change. And they're the people who can basically talk 
truth to power in these companies and they have the governments or regulators or compliance teams on on their side and and mm. lobbyists are essentially designers as well they're trying to kind of go out and design and, and make solutions for policy mm-hmm. makers sure mm-hmm. yeah i think yeah lobbying is um i think as as we t- were talking before recording might function or have a have a a different shade of meaning in uh in america just because of the way the relationship between corporate money mm. and government is not good it here. has an inherently negative meaning in the u.s is yeah. that true in the uk uh, it has uh, not quite as bad i just think because there's not such an exchange of of money there yeah. isn't an exchange right. of money in in quite yeah. the same way and i i don't know a lot about the american lobbying system but it's a an exchange, but it's also a kind of relationship as well. Mm-hmm. And so it is a connection, whether it has a kind yeah. of value exchange or not. Um, but yeah, it, it, there's the kind of political funding yeah. element, mm-hmm. which is not, which just doesn't exist in, in the Yeah, UK. and well, you, I, I think that's what makes it very, very different here. Yeah. Uh, and that's a whole, like, we could have 10 conversations about Citizens United, but I think the fact that it really is about literally purchasing influence yeah. and i think it, yeah, what it you, is purchasing it, it is definitely purchasing influence i mean and, the nra lobby is the first one that mm. comes to mind yeah and they literally they like they buy it's like they buy they votes buy politicians in yeah that's not to say that lobbying in general is a bad thing yeah. it's just mm. our american examples of lobbying tend to be very very bad people doing very bad things for mm. a tremendous amount of money actually not even really? that not much even that? no if you <laughs> if you if you take a look at the list of what the NRA has contributed to Congress people and senators, mm-hmm. it's so cheap to buy a congressperson. Oh, I was saying the salaries of the lobbyists themselves. Oh, I don't know. Like about that's that. the reason people leave government and go into lobbying. But that's a, a side issue. But I think what you're describing in an in a an improved uh, environment here, where the money wasn't as much of a factor, mm-hmm. yeah, having a good relationship and a conversation between influential businesses and government leaders, I think in a, a, an improved situation here would be would be good and productive because you because the people working in industry can tell the, the people leading like they should be saying, here's how technology works. Here's um, the relationship between technology and business and customers and the customers are also voters. So that's that's a conversation that should be happening yeah and i guess a better way to talk about it might be like policy people so yeah. people mm-hmm. who are like experts in in technology yeah. and regulation mm-hmm. who understand and have conversations with governments yeah. so maybe not the people who are directly doing the relationships and yeah um th- there's there's bad sides to all of this as well like yeah. in the uk as well just like people interested entirely in their relationships and in and having power mm-hmm. and that's that's how the, that's how they use the kind of their role within corporates to advance their own positions but there's also, I guess, civil society in the U.S. Lob- lobbies as well, like kind of charities mm-hmm. yeah. must lobby as as well, mm-hmm. or, or, or kind of for good causes as yeah. well. So there's a there's the other side to the coin as well, which is um, an important part of civil engagement. And I think in order to improve these systems, you need to um, understand what they are and try and fix those problems as well. So try and improve the relationship between policymakers and companies and, and make it more healthy as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think we just have so like such a large issue around expertise and getting the, like really identifying like who is a genuine expert. And I don't know if this is, a, I feel like it's a particularly bad problem in America, but I'm sure it's not solely an American problem. Like how do you tell who's a, a charlatan who's speaking on behalf of of getting a large paycheck and who genuinely has expertise because the uh, channels and outlets for people to have a conversation in public or share their expertise or be a, such a thing as a public intellectual have gone away because of the consolidation of media, because of the disappearance of of many publications, because there's just no funding and there's so much funding in these technology companies and they speak to themselves internally. And I feel like the conversation is not, we're not having an informed conversation in public among all these constituencies. And I don't know if that's the same over in the UK as well. Yeah, it's probably the same. And I guess it comes back to the point about diversity really, doesn't it? You need Mm -hmm. a a diversity and a plurality of media in, in different forms. I think the interesting example in the UK is we have the 
the BBC mm-hmm. as a as a kind of independent source of news as well, yeah. which is quite a different uh, public intervention. Yeah, which gives you an automatic kind of polarity. It has its own problems, but actually gets you gets you to a different place and in terms of those debates and public education. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that that's true. The the PBS uh, was on its way to becoming the something like the BBC, but then Nixon Nixon, Nixon destroyed when, it. Yeah, other people intervened. Nixon and other people really intervened. That's a whole thing. Yeah, so we we enjoy the BBC here too yeah. for for those we have. Well, we have like and NPR isn't bad. I would say in the especially around radio here, we've got the, no, not at all. It's it's really good. Um, it's just that it's not it what it, it could have been. Yeah, well, and it's perceived to have a very leftist slant, even though it absolutely does not. So there's well, I think in the U.S., anything that encourages people to think is said mm-hmm. to have a leftist, leftist stance. Slant. Yeah, Max, we got to We got to wind down. Yeah, but let's let's try to end this on a positive note. <laughs> Uh, what gives you hope? What gives me hope is that everybody has the capacity to make a difference and to be more responsible with what they do. As long as they try and seek out uh, and try and understand different people's perspectives. Um, social media and technology has democratized many different things like communications, but it's also democratized responsibility as well. So that we all have a responsibility to make the world a kind of little bit better. And that doesn't mean necessarily fixing things uh entirely but it means making things a little less shit like mm-hmm. making like that in your work like just how can you make things a little a little better it doesn't have to be the most dramatic mm-hmm. change and i think that's an amazing thing that technology has given us like the power to have an influence on a, on a mm-hmm. global scale and to make things a little less worse that's that's that's, that's a that's a good end that, that is a very a that is end. a very good end a- we're gonna everybody... leave it positive can do something. Yes, we're absolutely going to leave it positive. Well, uh, no, thank you. I was you. saying that from for myself. Oh, okay. Wait, don't, right. don't, don't mess it up. We don't got mess to a good up. place. We got to a good place. Keep your mouth shut, Mike. <laughs> Max, it's been a pleasure. No yes. thanks. Interesting conversation. Yeah, thank you. We thank try. you so much. We do. Sometimes yeah. we succeed. I think maybe today we succeeded. Did we? Perhaps we will let our our listeners decide. Well, thank you so much, all of you out there in cyberspace. I like saying that. Cyberspace. Like We're 90s. saying cyberspace now? We're definitely saying cyberspace. It makes it sound fun. Should we thank everybody for jacking in? <sighs> oh, my gosh. In here, if I wish I could make a good modem noise, but I, I can't. No one, no one knows what that is anymore. Here, I can. Oh, nice. Oh, we're doing sound effects now. Yeah, of course we're doing sound effects. (laughs) Yes, fantastic. So all of you out in cyberspace, thanks for listening. You can follow us on Twitter at VODROCKS, V-O-D underscore R-O-C-K-S. Please listen, tell your friends, rate us wherever you can rate us on things, and we'll see you next time. And Max Beverton Palmer, thank you so much for joining us today. It has been a pleasure. Thank you.